over 20 years. And uh, you can read her very impressive bio in your program. I'm going to tell you some things that aren't in the bio that are fun. For example, you can go to Front Porch Conversations with C, Lisa C. Williams. Write that down and see a program of an interview with Sharon about her family. She has an incredible family. Father was a general surgeon. Her mother was one of the hidden figures women, the mathematicians, university faculty member, you know, helped us get to the moon. And uh, Sharon plays the organ in her church and is probably one of the world's foremost experts on child and human trafficking, the exploitation of sexual images, you know, child pornography as it used to be called and sometimes still is called. So, you know, I'm really looking forward and she's, she's really good at addressing racism as a trauma. You did it very well, thank you. You did very well, thank you. I had to pay him a lot of money for that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so thank you. I want to just tell you all uh, that it's a privilege for me to be here with you this afternoon, and I am the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and I'm not a train. So we're going to talk today about the issues of racism, uh, implicit and explicit with respect to bias. And what I want you to understand is that there can be generational trauma and there is generational trauma that has been perpetrated over the years, causing us to have systemic trauma related to, to racism. Now that we can say the word systemic racism, you know, there was a time when we could not use that terminology. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about the differences between implicit and explicit bias. And we're gonna learn about the role of advocacy and anticipatory guidance for multidisciplinary team professionals to promote an expectation of equity. Because for those of us who work in child maltreatment, sometimes we see children and families who um, don't behave the way that we want to, and we become biased uh, against them just on general principle. And we need to really have a better understanding about what they've been through and why it is we should not pass judgment. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, why it's important for us to have as organizations a general philosophy of anti-racism. So I'm going to start, and I made this decision only about three days ago. I want to talk about missing children. Um, I don't know if you saw this front page article on uh, Wednesday of this week regarding two missing children and how they, their stories came out very differently. So I, I had the privilege of working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for over 16 years. And so I became pretty knowledgeable about the issues of missing children. And myself and a few colleagues wrote a book called Perspectives on Missing Persons Cases. And uh, when I saw this on the front page of USA Today, I said, oh man, I know that this is really an important topic because children who are minority children are really not valued as much when they go missing as compared to other children. And such was the case with this young girl uh, whose name is Alexis Patterson. She was seven years old when her stepfather uh, walked her to the uh, crossing to go to the school, get on the little school bus to go to school. And when she didn't come home on time, her mom went to the school and discovered she had never made it to the school. That was 20 years ago. She has never been seen since that time. She was seven years old. On the other, on the other hand, this is Elizabeth Smart, who, as you recall, was in her own bedroom and she was uh, abducted uh, and uh, in Utah, and was kept for nine months. And there were missing persons posters all over uh, looking for her. And fortunately, she was able to be recovered. Uh, the mother was told three days later, she was seven years old, and law enforcement said, well, maybe she'll come back. So they didn't even mount a search um, my, they didn't go looking for her at all for three days. And then at the end of three days, they said, well, she's probably a runaway. She's a seven-year-old. 
that was just the kind of thing that, you know, we would not even ever expect to hear from a system. Um, this was in Milwaukee, and uh, their, their response was very different as compared to Utah. Uh, and even the media coverage was minuscule for Alexis. And what's important for you to know is that law enforcement is the most prominent source in 87% of news stories about missing children. So uh, when you are a minority child and you are missing, very often in communities, the response is not the same, or at least it had been that way in the past. This is what we would have liked to have seen about her. And of course, now we have Amber Alerts. And that was named after Amber Hageman, who was a murder victim uh, who went missing as well. And what we now know, you will see the Amber Alerts that are on the uh, things on the highways with descriptions of cars and everything else that people can be on the lookout for that. But even with Amber Alerts, when Amber Alerts first came out, um, there was another problem as far as racism is concerned, because what we saw in the United States was that Amber Alerts were being called for white children far more frequently than they were for, for children of color. And that was just yet another dynamic that took some, some tree shaking in order to change the attitudes of individuals. Uh, so on Wednesday of this week was the 20th year that she has been missing. And this particular article is very uh, compelling because uh, the father, the stepfather of this child uh, who had walked her over to the school bus had had a prior criminal record, not a really significant one, but one of the things that had to be done at that time was that they did polygraphs on both parents, uh, inferring, you know, if you have a missing child and they do a polygraph on you, what does that make you think other people think? They think, it'll make you think that, that uh, they, they think you had something to do with the fact that they're a missing child. Uh, and this dad uh, wasn't completely honest on his polygraph related to the questions about his criminality, but not related to the questions about the fact that he had walked her to the school bus that morning, et cetera. And so because of that, that was one of the things that contributed to the three-day hiatus before they started really looking for her and um, started even speaking about her as a missing child. So uh, one of the things that's mentioned in that particular article was some discussion by the FBI about the long-term missing child guide for law enforcement. These are National Center for Missing and Exploited Children documents. And I'm very familiar with them because um, I was on their board for more than a decade and am really, I'm very knowledgeable about those particular dynamics. This, in, this particular one has to do with the Amber Alert process. And I think that what's relevant to us with, when we talk about implicit and explicit bias is that still today, children of color are not uh, sought after as aggressively as compared to other children who go missing. That still remains a, a significant problem. And the long-term missing guideline, which is, by the way, funded by uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, as well as several law enforcement uh, organizations in LexisNexis, talks about how they ask uh, parents to come in and get photographs of both parents, the mother and the father, and then they look at how the facial shape, et cetera, is for these parents. They use uh, technology from the Smithsonian in order to age progress what these children would look like as time goes on. And they tend to upgrade pictures of these missing individuals every five years. And so um, this is how she looked when she went missing. And this is her mother. And this is her age progressed image of what she would look like now, 20 years later. Uh, they look at both of the parents' whole uh, skeleton. And the technology, I've, I've been in that lab where they do the technology of age progression, and it's very impressive as to how they decide what you're going to end up looking like this many years later. So her mother has never given up hope that her daughter is still alive, in fact. And um, we're hoping the same for her as well. When we look at Black versus non-Black, female versus male children, what we find is that black children who are never found, as you can see, uh, are significantly higher in number as compared to non-black children. Uh, and how many of you can recall the Atlanta child deaths, if you can raise your hand? 
Right. There was a period of time in Atlanta, Georgia, where uh, particularly boys were the primary children who were found dead. Uh, and some of them were missing. And I remember that it was at a time when one of our, uh, the National Medical Association was going to have a meeting in Atlanta. Now the National Medical Association is the African-American version of the American Medical Association. And why did we have a National Medical Association? Because there was a time when black doctors were not allowed to be members of the American Medical Association. And in fact, the, um, Journal of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Pediatrics has a paper that came out 2019, I want to say, on truth and reconciliation. And that paper was written because they talked about why they would not let Black pediatricians be members of the American Academy of Pediatrics because they weren't members of the American Medical Association. And of course, they weren't members of the AMA because they weren't allowed to be members. They were discriminated against and not allowed to have membership. And the two uh, most important general pediatricians who wanted to become members of the American um, uh, uh, Pediatric uh, Society or American Pediatric Association was the chief of pediatrics at Howard and the chief of pediatrics at Meharry Medical College, the two black medical schools in the United States. So when we think about the history of racism and bias, in medicine, it's very alive and well and has been for a long time. And uh, it, it still has echoes that I'll be talking about a little bit as we think on this process. In a true fashion, there was a big, uh, big conflict here in Washington, DC about maybe three years ago regarding the fact that it seemed that the missing persons databases seem to reflect more white missing people as compared to black missing people. This was a really huge issue. There was a town hall meeting. Uh, there was a lot that went on in Washington, D.C. regarding that issue. And the organization Black and Missing was front and center. And I've had the opportunity to meet and talk with the founders of this particular organization because it is true, it is still true that um, children of color are not always a priority when they go missing. There's frequently lots of uh, caveats and reasons that are you know, given as to why a child is not home safely the way that they should be. And this is a dynamic that we need to be mi mindful of when we think about the whole issue of the safety of children um, with respect to racism and uh, bias. This is Elizabeth Smart when she was recovered, if you remember. And she was uh, for nine months missing under the, uh, she was abducted by this individual and his wife. And when she was recovered, she was responding to questions in what I refer to as old English script. You know, she was using these and thous, et cetera, when she was speaking to the people who were able to finally identify her. And she had started a foundation regarding um, missing and is a very much a very um, present and accounted for a person. She was, for, for her, fortunately, very well protected. Her parents uh, took her out of the country for a few years so that she would not continue to be the victim. You know how that can be very difficult for someone who has had an experience of having been abducted. And so when we think about the adverse childhood experiences study, which you're all familiar with, uh, we think about the modified additional factors of social conditions and uh, historical trauma. And I want to bring about this whole issue of historical trauma when we think about bias and we think about racism with respect to uh, this whole dynamic. So this is an article that was published in the, in the magazine The Atlantic in 2019. It was called Death by Civilization. And this was a, uh, a woman who was writing about her mother, um, who was a, a survivor of an Indian boarding school. How many of you all have heard of Indian boarding schools? Very good. I have, my great grandmother is a Cherokee Indian and I thought I knew about Indian culture. I have encyclopedias of Indian culture and it's been always an interest to me. Uh, when I look at some of my aunts on my father's side, they have these high cheekbones and you know, these really Indian faces and I you know, always like to think about that. It wasn't, however, until I uh, was going to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to testify in a court martial proceedings 
Um, I spent 22 years in the military and retired. And I was going to be testifying in a child homicide case there, and I was waiting. So I, you know, they, it snowed. So for one day, I had to wait an extra day to testify. So I drove down the interstate, and there was a Cherokee museum at the next exit. So I went down to this museum, and I'm walking to the museum, and I'm really struck by some of the pictures that they had um, of Indian children who all looked alike. All of their hair was cut at the same length. They had on these little white blouses and pleated skirts. And these were children who were in a Cherokee Indian boarding school. Not only was I really surprised to see this, that boarding school was one more exit down the road. And so I had to go down the highway and take a look at this building that was an Indian boarding school. When I got back to North Carolina, I went through all of my encyclopedias and all of my books and everything on Indian history, and I saw not a word about Indian boarding schools, not a word. Then I called Dolores Bigfoot down in uh, Oklahoma, who is a really uh, excellent person who works with respect to child maltreatment at the University of Oklahoma. And I said to her, Dolores, could, could you talk to me about this? And she said, my father was in an Indian boarding school. And she said, and he was really for all practical purposes, experienced some degrees of torture in Indian boarding schools. And we've heard more and more about truth and reconciliation, the issue of Indian boarding schools. 200 years ago, 1819, the Civilization Fund Act ushered in an era of assimilationist policies in the United States. And this act was spurred the creation of schools by putting forward the notion that native culture and language were to blame for what was deemed as the Indian problem. In the United States, we still have to get ourselves all together with the right terminology, don't we? Because for a long time, we've referred to individuals who are indigenous people as Native American. But if you talk to for real indigenous people, they'll tell you, we're not Native Americans, we were here first. So, you know, we really don't like for you to call us that. You should call us indigenous people. And if you set foot right across the border into Canada, uh, where I love the um, agency that's very similar to the National Center here in the United States, uh, they never refer to uh, individuals who are indigenous in Canada as anything other than First Nation. That's what they refer. So when, when they say, well, this is a First Nation child and they went missing and so on and so on, I'm like, it's First Nation. Okay, let me get it right. Um, indigenous people have had a hard time um, you may recall just about maybe three months ago, there was in the news, uh, the discovery in British Columbia, uh, just across the Canadian border, um, of some remains that were underneath what was an Indian boarding school in British Columbia. And I had gone, I'd had the opportunity to um, really understand this a little bit better because uh, in Pennsylvania, there is a uh, very renowned location for one of our advanced uh, army uh, colleges. It's called the War College. And if you really get to a certain rank and you're going to be a leader, you have to go to the War College. It's in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. Well, Carlisle Barracks was an Indian boarding school. And some of the older photos, you will see thousands of little Indian children, and they all look alike. All their hair is cut. They have on these little uniforms. And of course, you know that now that we have kind of outed the fact that this government uh, elite location for uh, advanced level military officers also is the home of dead children whose uh, bodies are buried there as well. And they are about the process of trying to make that into a memorial site. The same is true for this one in British Columbia. There is also not just an issue about Indian children who are dead, but also missing women, Indian women, missing and murdered Indian women is a whole category. And so there's an, there is a whole specific law about that called Savannah's Act that has to do with tribal lands and the fact that when um, indigenous women uh, go missing, for some reason, there isn't a response that we would like to see to go find them because there is such a significant concern regarding missing and murdered indigenous women. 
So have any of you ever heard of the Royal Commission out of Australia? Right. So the Royal Commission was a many yeared uh, study looking at um, the indigenous people of Australia and um, what had happened to them from the colonization by Great Britain. And I went to, I was invited to go and speak in Australia uh, at the Children's Hospital in Brisbane. And it was a, a lovely grand rounds kind of thing where that was gonna be uh, like this, where it was digitally around the country. And the chief of pediatrics gets up to introduce me and she starts out with a formal apology. I first would like to say that I apologize to all the indigenous people of Australia for, and she has this whole script of apology um, for what the uh, British people did when they came to Australia, they took people's lands, they killed people, they put them into boarding school scenarios, et cetera. And I was, I, I was really, I just could hardly believe it. I thought, man, I've never seen that before. Then after I did Grand Rounds, I actually went to a university for Argos, which is the federal police for the Australian Federal Police. And they asked, had asked me to come to, to, to speak at a conference uh, on child sexual exploitation, which is my real area. And what was hilarious to me was I said, okay, yeah, sure. I'm glad to talk about that. Is there anything particular about child sexual exploitation you're concerned about? They said, yes, doctor. We want to know why is it that the teenagers in uh, Australia really, when they're looking at images on the internet, they're always searching BDSM. I had to die laughing. I said, oh, ah, BDSM, a little sadomasochism here for your teenagers, right? Hmm. So I just, I was so happy to be able to be at the bottom of this huge amphitheater. And I said, let me start this conversation out with a music video. And I showed Rihanna in S and M. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but whips and chains excite me. That's the, if you don't know that song, that's the, that's the lyrics for that particular song. And you know, all of these people in the amphitheater, a lot of them were federal police and social workers and child protective services folks like you all. And they were leaning in and they're saying, I know that song, but they only knew the song by listening. They didn't know what the music video looked like, right? Because I often teach that it used to be that music was heard, but now music is seen. And when we see music through somebody else's eyes, it sticks to our brain. The mirror neurons of our brain will remember that this is what this really means, right? Uh, and so when I was there and I was getting ready to lecture before I gave my lovely music video of Rihanna, you know, in her, all her bondage images, uh, the very decorated head of the uh, Australian Federal Police got up and did the exact same, I want to apologize to all the indigenous people of Australia. I thought, wow, this is very serious. So um, this is a good example of racism. It is for non-indigenous people, uh, the issue of incarceration, 146 people per 100,000 people look at the indigenous rate of incarceration in a country where the original people or the what are sometimes referred to as aboriginal people. So it's a dynamic that we have to really be mindful of. This is a very common, this is out of Minnesota, and this is a very common image that you will see in honor of missing and murdered indigenous women. So you'll see this term, M-M-I-W, missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, in particular, in Minnesota, in Duluth, where they have the uh, ships that go down the Duluth River. Many times women are brought on board predominantly as uh, sexually exploited women, trafficked women, but they're never seen again, and they're indigenous women. Uh, and so that's another dynamic that is uh, alive and well. Well, when we think about the history of people being murdered and uh, people whose lives seem to be unimportant, this is called historical and generational trauma, right? And I remember, when I was asked to give a lecture on this particular subject. And I went to the literature and it talked about how the very first um, articles in the United States that were being written about um, individuals who were um, 
you, you know, mistreated because of their race had to do with the Japanese after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And those papers just barely preceded the Holocaust literature that was also uh, talking about what happened in Germany. And as I was reading uh, the literature in the United States on this fact, and I thought to myself, wait, wait, hang on, I'm a little confused here. We're talking, I get it, I do get it. I was stationed at, uh, in Hawaii, I've been to Pearl Harbor, and I know what happened to a lot of individuals who were Japanese Americans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they were in fact, um, not allowed to be free for almost three years. Uh, and of course, we, I think, all know about the Holocaust, but in the United States of America, what kind of history should we be talking about when we talk about subjugation as our biggest form? That would be slavery, right? Why would we say that the first real articles that have been written about, you know, um, this kind of maltreatment starts with the Holocaust and it starts with the Japanese who were interred in the United States when we have lynchings for years of individuals who were brought here as slaves. So that's another one of those very obvious, but not so obvious apparently to everybody else realizations. So when we think about the Philadelphia expanded component of the adverse childhood experiences survey, that was done in, in Philadelphia in 2013, it was asking questions about having witnessed violence, having felt discrimination, which we would refer to as racism, having um, an adverse neighborhood experience, meaning that you felt unsafe, um, having been bullied or having lived in foster care as additional adversities. In addition to the 10 uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, research that was done by Felidi and Anda. And so, there are those of us who recognize that maybe I have a bias against this person, maybe I don't have a bias or I don't know that I have a bias. That would be implicit bias. But I also wanna make mention of the fact that we are still in the land of America where there is quite clearly explicit bias, just in case you were unsure about that. There is no doubt in my mind that there's still very clear, explicit bias. And that is harmful to us uh, as individuals, especially for people of color, it's harmful. How many of us will walk into a situation uh, where we might be the only person of color and the other people who are in that group, uh, you know, have on a biker's outfit, you know, and they may have uh, I've, you know, there's a group called Bikers Against Child Abuse, and I love those. I really love that group. You know, and I went to a conference one time that was held in a convention center, and they had ramps on the stage of the convention center. And to my surprise, up rides <laughs> these bikers uh, in the convention center. And at first, I was like, "Where am I?" <laughs> but you know, it was really cool. And in fact, it was in Sioux Falls, in South Dakota. And I, and of course, why would there be bikers? Uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, because South Dakota is where Sturgis, South Dakota is, the greatest, largest bikers rally in the country. The at the time that I was in Sturgis, at the Child Advocacy Center, they're doing some training. Um, the poor Child Advocacy CAC folks, bless their hearts, had decided that they would go to the biker rally because they just wanted to you know, get a good handle on the, you know, trafficking of teenagers and whatnot. And so they roll their sleeves up. Sweet women, sweet women, bless their heart. They came back so shell-shocked. I was sitting there, I was sitting there with them, you know, and they were, you know, they were wringing their hands. They were going, you can't know. Oh my gosh, you know, and I was sitting there because I've seen, I've seen pictures of the Sturgis Spiker rally. And uh, when they had the uh, big um, training a couple of days later, the U.S. attorney was a speaker and he went on to say, we successfully uh, arrested and convicted seven, seven sex traffickers at the Sturgis Biker Rally. And everybody was really, yay, you know, but they had 750,000 people up there. Uh, and so it was really one of those dynamics that you have to be aware of in this particular case. So this whole issue of the entangled roots of racism, 
the issue of immigration, uh, what's going on in community contamination. Think of Flint, Michigan and the lead in the water in Flint. I've been up to Flint twice now. I was invited to come to give a um, lecture of encouragement to the pediatric healthcare providers because there were so many children who had toxic levels of lead. And, and they asked me to come as a developmental pediatrician and to, to just try to encourage parents to not give up on the well-being of their children. What a challenge, as well as those who worked in early intervention services and PTs and OTs and speech therapists who were working with children who had lead levels of 10 and 15 and 20 and 30. Uh, and, and, you know, when their parents didn't know at first that their water was contaminated, though they knew that it was a different color and they kept saying, what's wrong with the water here? It took a long time for Michigan, the state of Michigan, to acknowledge that there was lead toxicity in the water in Flint, Michigan. And Flint is a heavily minority community as compared to some of the parts of Michigan. So that whole component of racism with respect to environmental factors is yet another dynamic that uh, is really a challenge. Um, when we think about uh, the Asian immigrants, targets of um, when they had to be separated from their families, uh, the whole issue of Chinese laborers who were, um, pr the men were not allowed to come over. They were concerned about bringing in prostituted women. Um, this paved the way for the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. We wanted Chinese laborers to help us with the um, putting in of railroads. A lot of the labor for railroad ties, et cetera, were done by Chinese laborers. And then there was uh, a time when we had this Western command uh, right after notice April the 1st, 1942, um, the, this whole issue with respect to uh, the dynamics with uh, Japanese ancestry and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. For those of you who may not know, Guam is a territory of the United States, but Guam is where the Japanese landed to refuel on their way to Pearl Harbor. And I have flown to Guam, it's a long way from Honolulu, uh, and thank you. And because of that, the Guamanians were taken over completely by the United States. They were interred for almost three years. Um, and these were well-educated people, governors, uh, et cetera, in Guam. And um, they lost everything, they lost all of their, their possessions. They were interred, um, just as we had here in the United States, in, in, in Honolulu and Hawaii, we had Japanese internment uh, locations as well. A part of history that very often we do not hear about, do we? If you look at American history books in our schools and even in our colleges, you often do not hear about these dynamics. These are minority people. And um, Asian Americans are another group that are certainly at risk for uh, prejudice and bias. Uh, and therefore, when we were talking therefore about the literature on Japanese internment, and that's when I said, but wait, 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 what about the whole issue of slavery? That was just another piece of it that came to my mind. The number of children of, who have had a parent in prison um, is, is a big issue. Uh, this, these are the African-American uh, children who have had a parent in prison. These are for all the children who have had a parent in prison. And mass incarceration remains a really significant money-making venture and is thought to be extremely related to racism. Um, Michelle Alexander's book, of course, on mass incarceration has helped us to understand so much about what is going on. And now we um, are concerned about our ICE agents and what they're doing with respect to separating children from their families at the borders and what's going to happen in the future as far as that's concerned. So think, therefore, about the mother who's getting ready to get pregnant. And she has experienced and continues to experience racism. And she worries about that baby that she's getting ready to have. And she has a few other adversities, perhaps. So her circulating level of cortisol is going to be and becomes more and more elevated over time. And what the research is now showing as of 2018 is that when you have 
women in the preconceptive period or when you have women who are pregnant, women of color who are pregnant uh, and who've had significant adversities already in their lives. Those toxic levels of cortisol are crossing the placenta and crossing into that developing fetal brain. And there is a higher risk for develop, neurodevelopmental disruption in these unborn babies who then get to be born and start to have perhaps a lot of irritability in that first year of life, the baby who's crying all the time, the baby who's difficult to console. These are the very same ba babies that I would be seeing in my developmental pediatric clinic um, who were language delayed and may have had some motor problems as well. And if our mothers are not and fathers are not prepared to handle those babies correctly, it can become a high risk for child maltreatment. Uh, and or neglect. Uh, so you have this, we are now coming to this realization. And if we think about ACEs and what can we be doing in order to make things better, we need to be thinking about before babies are ever even born. How many of you are aware of what happens with women of color, particularly African-American women who are pregnant and the problems that they have with respect to survival even? with respect to pregnancy and delivery. We know that they have the highest death rate, 242% more likely to die than, and this is a black woman with a college education as compared to white women who don't even have a high school education. And this is from the CDC that helps us to recognize that being educated is not what's gonna make the difference. What's gonna make the difference is trying to diminish the degree of adversity in the very beginning. But if in fact you have a woman who's already had significant adversities in her growing up years, then at the time she gets pregnant or there be, or before, we need to start working on non-pharmaceutical means of helping her to tamp down that stress and tamp down that fearfulness and tamp down uh, that circumstances she may be in, which may be in a violent circumstance, which is only going to make that pregnancy that much more difficult for her. So uh, we have some things to do when we think about adversities long before children are even born. Studies from Harvard helped us to know that unequal treatment of healthcare, education, child welfare, justice systems, entrenched barriers of economic advancement and cultural racism are going to be plaguing children of color. And because of that, uh, we, if you are a social worker with Child Protective Services, I want you to be thinking about that when you have those mothers who are maybe not so okay uh, when they are uh, being discharged from the hospital. When you get that call that says, we have this mom, we're just a little bit worried. That mom's at high risk for postpartum depression. And if you have a mother of color who has postpartum depression, some of those mothers can become psychotic, in fact. And uh, we have to be really mindful about how to have the right services in. I had a child maltreatment case, an abusive head trauma case that came into one of the hospitals that I was working in where both parents were deaf. And it was the father who had shaken the baby. And the baby was just a six week old baby and he had really significant brain injury. And I remember going in to talk to the father with an interpreter. And he was saying to me, uh, through the interpreter. I just wanted him to smile and he wasn't smiling. He kept making this face, you know, it looked like he was mad at me. And I said, stop doing that, stop doing that. And then finally he stopped doing it. And I said, I'm gonna put him down and I'll wait till he can play baseball with me. That's what the father said to me through an interpreter. That was a, such a wake up call for me because I went back to that nursery where this baby was born. And oh yes, there was a referral put in because this is a baby born to two deaf parents, right? There was a referral for case management, all of that. This baby at six weeks of age was number 300 on the referral list. So there was not gonna be someone who would be there in time. So I remember when I had to testify in court, you know, at this um, father's a hearing with respect to his culpability for this abusive head injury issue. And I wrote in my notes, you know, I see this more as a system issue, less of a father issue, because unless there was somebody helping him to understand that a crying baby's face doesn't mean that the baby dislikes him. Unless you have that kind of situation, 
uh, I don't know how you can hold this person so, so, so accountable in a situation like that. Um, we have to be really mindful about the barriers that are there. Let's talk about schools. Do you think there's some problems with racism in schools? Yeah. I love the amen corner. <laughs> They're, they're right out there. I can hear them. Oh, 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 oh. We were talking about that last night or today, this morning maybe. What was it yesterday evening? I was talking to Randy and today, and, and I was talking about how I had lived in Greensboro. I was born and raised. I wasn't born in Greensboro, but I was living in Greensboro, North Carolina, where a and State University is and where those first sit-ins started at the Howard Johnson's. And um, I went to a school as a third grader uh, that was first, this is first year was ever desegregated. There were 900 students in the school. There were three black students. I was one of them. And I remember being in the uh, third grade and the teacher, you know, walking up and down the aisles and I, she asked us to write our names. And I wrote my name, write your whole names. I wrote my name, Sharon Patrice Watkins. That was my name. And uh, she looked and she said, Sharon Pat Rice Watkins is that your name? And I said, well, <laughs> it's not usually Sharon, but anyway, <laughs> this is what it is. And she said, and you can write and you can read. She was so astounded, you know, that I was a third grader and I could read and write. And it was going to not be a good year. <laughs> can tell you uh, in that situation. Uh, my parents decided after that year to send me to a different school, different kind of school, so that um, I wouldn't be such an odd person out. Uh, the United Negro College Fund, we can be grateful for, for monitoring K through 12 disparity facts. And here's some of the facts that they let us know that African-American students are less likely than white students to have access to college ready courses in the schools that they attend. 57% of black students had access to full range of math and science courses as compared to 81% of Asian American children and 71% of white children. The research has also shown that there's a systematic bias in teacher expectations for African American students and uh, non-black teachers were found to have lower expectations of black students than black teachers, which is why when we started getting into desegregating schools, you may recall, there was some pushback a whole lot of pushback by African-American families because they said, wait, wait, these teachers don't have the best interests of our children at heart. These teachers are just going to pass our children over or they're going to vilify our children or they're going to adultify our children. Whatever it is, we're not so sure we want to send our children to this school uh, that they have bust to and get on a bus many, uh, many minutes, if not an hour beforehand in order to go to that school. Is it really a good thing? Uh, black students spend less time in the classroom due to discipline, which hinders their ability to have a quality education. Black students are nearly two times as likely to be suspended uh, without educational services as compared to white students who get suspended, but they're still given their assignments to do, even though they're they are uh, suspended. And um, black students are 3.8 times as likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions as compared to white students. And let me tell you how I have seen this in my developmental pediatric practice. Um, I've had, you know, preschoolers, we're talking not yet even in kindergarten, who get suspended. And they, and listen, if they're in early in pre-K, they usually have speech and language problem or some kind of developmental issue. That's how they got in early in pre-K in the first place. And they're suspended, suspended. How do you suspend a three-year-old? How do you suspend a four-year-old? You know, I just have to get on the telephone and call the principal. Help me out here. What's wrong with your teachers? Who suspends? And, and what, imagine the impact on the family to have their poor little sweetheart going to school, all dressed up with their pigtails, ready to go, and then they get suspended because they had a temper tantrum. Um, black children, ooh, sorry. Black children represent, let me go back to that slide. I think it was, yeah, 19% of the nation's preschool population, but 47% of those receiving more than one out of school suspension. 47%. In comparison, white students represent 41% of preschool enrollment, but only 28% of these students get an out-of-school suspension. And even more troubling, black students are 2.3 times as likely to receive a referral to law enforcement as, a, as compared to white students. That's where you 
um, start the process of the prison, the, the cradle, the prison pipeline, which is a concept that is written about uh, quite a bit by the Children's Defense Fund. Still separate and unequal teaching about school segregation and educational inequality is an article that talked about more than half the nation's school children are in racially concentrated districts. 75% uh, of students are either white or non-white. And these, these districts are in essence segregated by income, not so much by race, by income. Um, no one is really talking about school segregation anymore. Uh, it's a shame because an abundance of research shows that integration is still one of the most effective tools that we have in achieving racial equity as long as you have teachers who are going to nurture every child in that classroom as compared to vilify them. That uh, rich poor divide in education is also another dynamic because in uh, schools where you have predominantly white students, you have $1,500 or more spent on child on children as far as uh, the, during the course of the school year, um, more so than the poorest 25% of the school districts. One third of all black kids under 18 were living in poverty and um, as compared to a quarter of Hispanic children and 11% to 10% of white and Asian children. So poverty is yet another dynamic. And so the point at Stanford University is the realization that school segregation is not so much by color, it's by income. And that's just yet another component that we may not have recognized. So the United Negro College Fund helps us to know that instead of that $1,500 per child per school year, um, students of color are often concentrated where schools have fewer resources and schools with 90% or more students of color, $733 are spent per year uh, per student. That's less than half of uh, what's spent in schools where the students are predominantly white. I show you this little image because this is the scene of the Alex Haley farm, Alex Haley who wrote Roots. And um, I go to the Alex Haley farm every summer because the Children's Defense Fund owns the Alex Haley farm. And they have in the summertime in July of the year, a uh, child advocacy ministry divinity course there so that uh, no matter your, your race or creed, you can come and learn how to make children one of the most important parts of your of your theology so that you're going to do the right thing by children. Um, and this is our colleague who couldn't be here today, but um, I wanted to make sure Randy knew that she's here in spirit. And that's Stacy Patton who wrote the book, uh, Spare the Kids, uh, Why Whooping Children Won't Save Black America. When I found out about this book, I bought 50 copies because I worked in a big pediatric clinic and I wanted all the pediatricians to have this book <laughs> so that they could you know, start thinking about how can we not really endorse beating our children? It really doesn't make them better. Uh, corporal punishment is a big issue and it's a big issue from my perspective in schools because when you have corporal punishment in schools, that can be a hostile work environment for children. Um, there are 19 states that still allow corporal punishment. Notice Texas is surely one of them. And um, we had a congressional briefing about that uh, not that long ago. And it dawned upon me that in every single one of those 19 states, there were military installations. This was very interesting to me, Randy, because military installation school systems are federal schools. So there's no corporal punishment in federal schools. And I began, my wheels began turning about, well, not everybody at a military installation can live on post. So those children who are assigned to live on post can be safe. There's no problem with corporal punishment in those schools, but all those other families that can't live on post because there's not enough housing, they're gonna be going to schools where their children like to be beaten in the school system. There must be some leverage there that might have something to do with money uh, with respect to either housing or corporal punishment, uh, getting rid of that. Um, the incidence of corporal punishment per students, as you can see, is much higher when, when students are Black. In Mississippi and Alabama, Black students are 51% more likely to be hit than white students in more than half of these states' districts. And one-fifth of the districts in Mississippi and Alabama, this, the likelihood is 500%. Um, and so, you know, this is another piece of the racism and bias that is so uh, much of a problem. How many of you all have ever heard of this study, Girlhood Interrupted? Very good. 
This is from Georgetown Center on Poverty and the Law, and I really encourage you to look it up. I heard about it at the Children's Defense Fund at the Haley Farm. That's the first time I ever heard about it, and I said, okay, this is why I come here every summer, so I can find out about this. Um, what they found was that uh, when they looked at the plight of Black girls, they found that um, quite a few systems saw Black girls as being not needing nurturing, not needing protection, not needing support, didn't need it to be comforted. They were seen as more independent than other kindergarteners. These are all kindergartners. Uh, they were seen as knowing more about adult topics and they seemed to know more about sex. And so because of this, they felt that black girls were really more grown. These are five-year-old kindergartners. They're more grown than white girls or anybody else. Now, how do you get more grown? If you're five, if you're five, you're just five, right? That's just who you are. So that dynamic and subsequent studies uh, that looked at adult women who had had that experience when they were younger um, have has led to a concept called the adultification bias, that black girls are seen as adults as compared to white girls. Uh, in school systems, and they're treated in that way, uh, which is not, it, they're not allowed to be young girls as they may be. Now, we're not helped by the fact that if you look at sexual maturation, physical sexual maturation, um, Black girls enter into puberty first as compared to white girls and Hispanic girls. Um, it is also a challenge because you may have breast development and you may have pubic hair, but that doesn't mean that your brain is more mature. In fact, it is not more mature. You're just about the same as everybody else. So this whole seeing black girls as being more adult-like only makes them at higher risk for juvenile justice uh, problems if they should have any types of behaviors that are not seen as towing the line. Um, this adultification bias of black girls compared to white girls, please notice right in here, and especially right here where you have Black girls are here as compared to white girls all the way up through the ages of 15 to 19. This is why when I was talking to Benita Carter at the uh, sex trafficking program called Breaking Free in Minnesota, she told me about how she would have um, black girls and white girls in her program. And many of the white girls would say, you know, they did a raid on that strip club. And yeah, you know, we were underage, but you know, the, the police, they were driving us to the precinct and they stopped and they let all the black girls get out. And they kept us white girls in the paddy wagon and they brought us in and put us in juvenile detention. And we said, hey, hey, why you let all the black girls get out? And this is what they said to Benita Carter. Uh, she and I wrote a chapter about this. She said that the white girls who were, all, everybody was a trafficking victim. The white girls were told by the police, oh, those black girls, they're animals. This is what they're good for. So that's why we let them out of the truck. You, you're better off. You're, we're going we're gonna to save you. That's why we're taking you down here to get you some help. That is in Minnesota, which I consider Minnesota to be a very progressive state. And I was really shocked to hear that. But racism is very alive and well when we think about what goes on. So I want to um, talk to you a little bit about Title IX. So Title IX, as you may know, is a federal law that says that um, if there is sexual harassment or sexual assault in federally funded educational locations, um, that is against the law. And it's a federal violation as compared to a state violation. If you haven't read the book Missoula, I would highly recommend that you do because it's about um, you know, Title IX violations at a university where there was a lot of sexual assaults going on of girls in that school by the football teams and how it was covered up by the, um, by the coaches. But I want to tell you about a case I worked in. Um, and this is a real case. It's a Title IX violation case that I think will illustrate for you reasonably well the issues that I'm talking about. There were two girls. These two girls, one was black, one was white. They went to the same school in North Carolina as a high school. Let's talk about the issue of Title IX. There was um, a subsequent um, sexual harassment, sexual violence occurrence for both of these girls. And how I came to be involved with them was that there was a federal uh, prosecution, so to speak, for uh, on the basis of Title IX violations. 
So let's talk about the black girl first. She was a straight A student. She was um, an 11th grader, soon to be a 12th grader. Quiet, shy. Her only uh, getting outside her box was some of the text messages that she would send. She was trying, you know, trying to be hip in text messages. And you know how children will have alter egos of text messages, like they're really cool and hip. Um, she eventually went for a walk with the offender in this case, who was a for sure, for sure bad boy. You know, those kind of guys that are in schools. Um, and she, he was the same race as she was. Uh, he was very violent. He was going to sexually uh, assault her, but she told him that she was on her period as she was crying. And so he made her get on her knees and he um, assaulted her in her mouth until he ejaculated in her mouth. When she was crying, he was holding on to her hair and moving her head until uh, he ejaculated. And when he finally pulled his penis out of her mouth, he um, she spit it out. And so there was all of this DNA evidence on her buttocks. Um, she called her parents right away. And, um, but she told the SROs, the school resource officer, uh, what had happened. And he said, I think it was your fault. I think you lured him in. And you better be careful because you might get prosecuted for this. Uh, she also, her parents took her to the emergency room. They did a rape kit on her. Uh, and the sexual assault nurse examiners waited and they waited and they waited, and no police ever came to collect the rape kit. I've seen that happen. Have you ever seen that happen? Yep, I have too. Um, the principal softly threatened her that if an investigation resulted with no findings, she would be reprimanded, and for sure that would keep her from getting into the college that she wanted to go to. She was a straight-A student, remember? Eventually, she got to go to the college that she wanted to go to, even though it was very hard because she was very traumatized. Uh, but she had to drop out because she had so much she had so much uh, PTSD, and she in fact uh, became suicidal and was uh, hospitalized uh, during the course of that period. She was interrogated by law enforcement for I, I reviewed the whole tape. The interrogation took about two and a half, almost three hours of her asking what really happened. You asked for it, didn't you? I was, it, there was a whole video of the interrogation, so I had a chance to see it all. And I was so, uh, I was just so appalled because I thought to myself, this is a victim we're talking about, not an offender, but they absolutely treated her as if she were an offender. This is the other student in that school. She was white. She had a long-term relationship with an abusive boyfriend. He was a bad boy. Uh, he, she was white and he was black. Not the same guy who had sexually assaulted this other victim. The episode uh, that happened on campus was uh, a sexual assault that was more violent than usual. And the victim finally decided that she, wanted, she had reached her breaking point. So she made a disclosure. Sorry, Ooh, what happened there? Let me go back up here. Uh, let's see. Am I in control of that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, let's go back up to where I just was. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it just went, oh, I'll put that down. <laughs> um, let's see, right there, a little bit further down. Yeah, there we go, thank you. She also got to go to the school, thank you, that she wanted to go to and uh, it was hard for her. She was a smart girl as well, but she became suicidal and uh, had to drop out of school, never did go back to school. Um, the same SRO, school resource officer, had contacted the police and tried to thwart the uh, evaluations, but they did indeed um, do an evaluation for her. And even though she was in a consensual sexual relationship with this young man for a period of time, and then there was this one incident, uh, when the attorney um, went to court for the uh, Title IX violations, who do you think's case uh, was successfully uh, prosecuted and who do you think's case was not? You and I would think that because you had a teenager in a consensual relationship with a person for almost a year, and now they've had this one encounter where uh, she felt that it was too much and she didn't, she didn't want 
to have to go through that anymore. We might think that she would be the one that would not be seen as a victim of a Title IX violation necessarily. But what did I tell you about her? She was not Black. So the victim who was Black, who had all of the evidence for whom the police did not come to collect the evidence at the, at the instruction of the SRO, they threw her case out. But the other victim's case was successfully uh, prosecuted. Um, it really is a wake up call. You can have dehumanizing uh, medical treatment. Uh, and I'm gonna end with this last case. Um, this is a three year old victim. This all has to do with bias and it has to do with racism. Uh, a three year old little boy who came into our emergency room, he was in a lot of trouble. He was um, hypothermic. His parents were Somalian and um, they had been in the United States from the time, shortly after he was born, they brought him to the United States. They didn't know that there was anything wrong with him. Uh, but when he came in looking poorly like this, we saw him, he had this really big head. We did a, we did a CT on his head and he had hydranencephaly. He had no uh, significant brain um, matter, mostly fluid. He was both blind and deaf. He uh, had always been a feeding problem, but he had not been diagnosed. Uh, up until that point. His CT scan was very significantly abnormal and uh, hydranencephaly is usually associated with death shortly after birth. Many hydranencephalic patients don't survive delivery. Uh, however, the parents um, heard about their child and they wanted to just make sure there wasn't anything else to be done for him and they begged and pleaded, could they at least see a neurosurgeon to see if there was anything that could be done for their son. He was, he was in, in bad shape. So we arranged to take him to a local hospital where there was a pediatric neurosurgeon. And um, we got there, the neurosurgeon got another CT because he wanted to see it himself. And um, he had a resident with him at the time. <clears throat> and he came to the bedside. I was there in the emergency room with the family uh, because this child was so unstable. I went with him down to that particular hospital and he stood right next to the bed of this little dying child and said, as he put the CT scan on the screen, look, this is exactly what an alligator brain looks like. Isn't it amazing? This is what this white neurosurgeon said to these black Somalian parents about this little boy who was dying. The parents were just totally undone, as you might imagine. And they turned to me and looked at me as if I had betrayed them forever and ever. And they said, we just want to leave here. Um, we did get him back to the other hospital and he died just a few hours later. And they were convinced that um, it was because of their brown skin that this physician could be so callous and dehumanizing to speak of their dying child as if he were not a human. Um, that was a, if, if I hadn't been there, I would have probably not believed that it could have happened. But this is a good example of racism and bias it, that is beyond description. So what can we do? When we hear about that kind of thing, when we hear about explicit racial bias, we should validate our patient's feelings. We should not say, oh, oh, he didn't mean it. We should, no, we should not uh, align ourselves with someone who has truly hurt a family uh, with respect to their child. We need to acknowledge when people have done the wrong thing. We can offer some response on, the ha on behalf of the family. And I wrote a letter to the hospital and to the neurosurgical practice regarding how this had affected that family and how I felt that that was so inhumane. And most of all, we can apologize, even though we weren't the ones that did cause this extreme pain and suffering for the family. We want to let the family know that it's not something we would ever condone. Remember that the medical condition, condition and the normal aspects of death and dying can make those last hours unforgivably memorable for families and for them to have seen their child die under the, you know, under the cloud of someone referring to their child as if he wasn't even human was just really so bad. Um, uh, we did offer a follow-up with that family and they did come back after the child had died so that we could just talk to them and try to make sure that things were, that they were going to be okay. But of course they were never gonna really be okay. So if you see something, you wanna say something. Many hospitals are establishing a proactive anti-racism organizational practice and culture. I noticed the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has 
uh, that type of program going on now. And I think that any children's hospital should be thinking about this. Um, how can we make our uh, organization as anti-racist as possible? Because this is the way we will do the very best that we can. Um, the final point is that um, if there is no struggle, there's no progress. And I really want to thank you so much for um, your having paid attention. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm very happy to be able to respond to that. Thank you.